Cross Culture. Praise God. Praise God.
Let's sing nothing. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore.
I give you control and consume me from the inside out, Lord. And let justice embrace and become my embrace to love you from the
my life be lifted high. That he is the biggest priority, the focus of our lives. That everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we believe all bubbles up to him. But it also means that there is no failure, there is no sin, there is no circumstance that could ever be higher than He is. Because He is greater, He is more powerful, He is more loving than even your deepest and darkest of failures. The second part to that bridge says, in our world be lifted high. That despite the current events, despite the wars that are happening, despite the hardships that are that's going on in, in, in our society, He is still sovereign. He is still King, and He is still above all. And finally, in our love be lifted high. That we serve others not for our own fame, not for our own glorification, but because we serve others to serve Him. That every action that we do, every kind word we say to one another is to glorify God Himself. That in our relationships, in our marriages, in our friendships, in how we interact with people in the workplace or in school, God is glorified. See, in those three words, in those three lines of just one song it showcases our belief our declaration and our directives Father God we come before you today Lord humbled in our failures humbled in what we have done but we know Lord that you are greater than all of this we know Lord that you are our king. You are sovereign over all the events in this world, including the Middle East, oh Lord. We know the hardships that are happening there, and we pray and we ask, Lord, that you will be in the midst of all the decision makers, that those that are making, making these choices will see you and see the effects of what is being done, oh Lord. We pray, Lord, for those uh, communities, oh Lord, that are that are a victim of these decisions, oh Lord. And we pray and we ask, Lord, that you will be in their midst. And in this hardship, in this, in this chaos, and in this war, oh Lord, they will seek refuge in you. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the believers that are, that are there. That they will use this opportunity to show, to show who you are in their love and their service to, to others. That they will not only just spread the good word, but they will also spread your mercy and your grace. That you will use this opportunity, Lord, to, to expand your kingdom, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the relationships that we have, the things that need to be healed, O oh Lord. We pray and we ask, Lord, that you will heal it, that you will bring it to light, and that most of all, Lord, you will give us the boldness and the confidence in you to heal these wounds, oh Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, for our speaker today, that he will speak, Lord, with wisdom, authority, of the message, Lord, that you have um, entrusted to him, oh Lord. And we pray, Lord, that as he speaks each word, that it will fall upon our ears and our hearts, Lord, as tilled soil, that it will blossom, Lord, into actions throughout the rest of the week, and that we will better citizens of the kingdom because of it. We pray, Lord, for life change, for heart change, oh Lord. And most of all, we pray, Lord, that your kingdom will be glorified because of this. Lord, you are our God, you are our King, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Cross Culture. We appreciate you joining our worship service today, both in person and online. As part of our worship service today, we'd like to give you the opportunity to serve by giving. 
If you are able to support our ministry financially today, there are two ways that you can give. You can go online to thecrossculturechurch.org. You can mail checks to 9659 Balboa Boulevard, Northridge, California, 91325. You can also use your smartphone by downloading our church app at the App Store called The CC Church and find the icon on giving. If you're in the chapel worshiping with us, please drop your offerings in the boxes provided in front of the altar. We thank you for all your prayers and financial support. All your giving is tax deductible. The month of April is our Sunday sermon series on being God's building project. Our Lord said, I will build my church and the plans of hell shall not prevail against it. This means that with an incredible God, we have unstoppable lives. He is renewing us, restoring us, and giving us the right resource to live victorious lives. Don't fail to be in church every Sunday. On April 21st, our care groups will start a study on Created to Dream. This six-week lesson by Pastor Rick Warren will help you pursue your God-given dreams in spite of obstacles and delays. Don't put your dreams on hold because of trying circumstances. Discover God's deliverance to fulfill your God-given dreams. Join a care group now. If you need prayer after service, please see one of our pastoral team on the right side of the altar. Be assured that the church is praying for you. Please send the link of this service to your friends and family. That's all for now. Be safe and God bless you. If only I could go back and change some things, set things straight. I wish I had a do-over. I've made choices. I've lost out. I've wished a thousand times I could go back and try again. It's hard not to imagine what might have been. If I had just stopped to think. If I had just done as I was told. If I hadn't thought I knew it all. Why didn't I just take a few deep breaths? It took one second to listen. Maybe my life would be better. Maybe there wouldn't be such a high price to pay. Things would be different now. I wouldn't have so many regrets. everything lost? Can I just get a do-over? Is there a way back to new beginnings? Because regret can mean a new beginning. When it's given to the one who produces a repentance. A repentance that delivers me from my grief. The one who takes my mistakes. And somehow redeems me through them. Who tells me I'm not the sum total of all my regrets? He tells me not to look back. Because there's nothing there to see. I am not my mistakes. He is faithful and just to forgive me. I just have to ask him. And then I can look straight forward. Forget what is behind me. And strain towards what is ahead. And walk away with all regrets erased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every day I'm given a clean slate. A clean slate? I get a clean slate. Good morning. How many of you this morning would like to have a clean slate? Some of you lost your cool this morning. But you know what? All of us need a clean slate. Say the word clean slate every day. Because the Bible says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end, they are new every morning. That means he withholds what we deserve, that is judgment. God is patient with us. And uh, life is a series of new beginnings. How many of you knows about that? That life is a series of new beginnings. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, tomorrow has enough of its own anxiety, but live for today. In 2023, three out, of, three out of 10 marriages failed. Two out of 10 businesses failed. Two million college kids drop out of college and pain comes along with it. 
And every time there is failure, and every time somebody quits, there is pain that goes with it. I've been, when I was young, I've been dumped twice. It was painful. I was tall, dark, and never mind. But it was then. The way I looked then, it was understandable, but not now. But everyone has their lot on failures. How many of you, sometimes you can recall and remember the things that you, 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 you regret and you wish that you didn't do or say? Sometimes I would recall things that I've done that I have nightmares that I, I'm still like reliving them. Like for example, when I was carrying Abigail when she was small and when on the way out of the, of, of, of the house and she put her finger in between the, 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 the door and I was about to close it. And then what happens if I slam it strong, I could have cut her fingers. I was scared about that. But it was an accident. But there are times that we made choices which are deliberate and we still regret up to this point. And many times, and we can say, if only, if I could, if could have been, should have been, but let me tell you this, even the greatest of all failures, God can overlook and oversee the future. Amen? Failure is inevitable. It happens to all of us. I had my own lot of failures. As a matter of fact, you... You can see right now, preaching before you is a fantastic failure. I have so much in my history that when I was in the first grade, all I loved was just to play, play, and play, and play. I cannot understand anything about academics. So my, my sister gave me a tutor so that I can learn how to read. And then the teacher would help me to read, and I was looking at the book, and when I'm looking at the book, she would say what it, what's the, the sentence. And then, okay, you repeat it back. I would repeat it back, but my eyes is looking at the kids playing basketball because I memorized it, but I don't know what, it, what the words w- w- were. So I was so dumb in, because my, my, I, had, I didn't like to study. I don't like numbers. I don't like words. I just want to play. And then at the end of the year, they talked to my sister and said, you know what, Eugene didn't learn anything this year. We have to retain him. So they retained me in, on the first grade. Then as far as I can remember, I learned to read when I was in the fifth grade. And on the sixth grade, I began to read and read and read and became good at it. But one thing when I was reading, I look at the, we were all wearing shorts that time at sixth grade in, in, a, in a private school. And I look at my neighbor, my friend, why, are, why his legs don't have hairs? And then I remember, oh my goodness, they retained me when I was in the first grade, so I'm older than all of them. So I have hairs on my legs, and I said, whoa, that's just embarrassing. It's embarrassing, all of them. I'm the only one who have hairs on my legs. So that 13 years of age, when I was on the sixth grade, I gave my life to Jesus, and there was an authentic transformation there. I cried before the Lord when I read the book of John when Jesus was crucified. Then... First year in, in high school, I made it to the honor roll list. Praise the Lord. Can you give the Lord a hand of praise for that? What a redemption. What a redemption. So I made it on the honor roll list. There are 15 on the honor roll list. I was number 12. Praise God. At least I'm number 12, not in the back of the paper. So after that, Second year in high school, I begin to learn how to drink, then begin to experiment with marijuana, and then for 10 years, my life was morally and academically on a downhill. All went south. So when I got to college, I carried that kind of lifestyle, and instead of me fin- finishing civil engineering for five years, I finished it in 10 years. I was a street engineer before I became an engineer. I was beside the street drinking beer. So my life was a total failure from failure to failure. But when I was 24 years old, I gave my life back to Jesus Christ. After 10 years, I saw Jesus in my prayers. And he appeared in in a very glorious way. There was like a silhouette of bright light. But I knew it was him. 
And I could not explain how it, it is because Jesus doesn't want to be explained. He wants to be experienced. Say the word experienced. So that night when I had that experience with Christ, when he revealed his, his, himself, his manifest presence, we call it, and then I was totally transformed. And praise God, I mean, I'm back. But that did not stop the failures from coming. Still, failures came and came and came and came. And I learned from that failure. And whatever I'm doing now, it is because learning from those failures, even when I became a Christian and even when I became a pastor. How many of you have bouts of failures? How many of you have thoughts of failures? How many of you are thinking that you're going to fail? How many of you have those random thoughts, what happens, this, 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 and that? But let me tell you this, God can change that totally. So my message this morning is having a clean slate. And how can we have a clean slate? My friends, it is never too late to what you could have been. You can have the best version of yourself beginning today. All your failures ended last night, and today is a new day, and a day is a new, new life for you, because life is a series of new beginnings. Today, today is the tomorrow you were worried about yesterday. Today has enough of its own anxieties. My friend celebrated his birthday, and uh, he's, of course, he, he was my classmate, so he's one year old, younger than me, and I wrote him, smile always because every day is worth it. Every day is worth it. So for me, I am where I am today because of, of learning from the past, because the past is a place to learn, not a place to live. The past is a reference, not a residence, and we can learn from all of them. Today, we're going to learn the greatest failure ever done in scriptures. How many of you that the, the greatest failure ever achieved is found in the scripture? Who do you think has the greatest failure of all? It's Peter. It's Peter. And my subject is getting a new slate by overcoming your failures. How to overcome failure. If you don't know the, 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 the anatomy of failure, if you don't know how to analyze failure, if you don't know how to get out of failure, then my friends, you are dead before you die. Peter made the greatest failure in the universe because Peter that night when Jesus was betrayed, he said, I'll be given to the hands of sinners. And he said, Jesus, you won't. I will die for you, Jesus. And guess what happened? And when he was, Jesus was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter denied Christ three times. Because Jesus said to him, well, you, you are willing to give your life to me. But before the rooster crows to Today, you will deny me three times. He said, no, Lord, I will give my life for you. And that Peter did that night. Now, listen to me very carefully. Peter denied Jesus according to his prediction that you will deny me three times on his face, to the face. Face to face, he denied his friendship with Jesus. Look in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 6 and 61. 22, 61, 62. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And because of that, he went outside and wept bitterly. How many of you know that Jesus that was denied face to face? We only thought, oh, Peter denied him three times, but it was face to face. But let me tell you about the gravity of the offense that Peter made. In the all of Scripture, there are only two places wherein God had face to face with man. And between that, God never showed his face. The first time that God showed his face to man was in the book of Genesis when Adam has not sinned. And from the cool of the day, God will come down to Adam and speak to him. Just like what we're doing today. God, in the beginning of time, 
We hear that in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the same God. And he was talking to, to Adam. That's the first time God and man had a face-to-face -face conversation. And you know, when was the second one? The second one was in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. Nothing has been made that was made without Him. Up to 14, and the, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and that is Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, He said about Jesus, that which we have touched, that which we have handled, the word of life is Jesus that came in the flesh, God himself. And on the second occasion, we find the representative of the human race, Peter, denied Jesus face to face. I don't know him. And Jesus looked at him. And then Peter remembered what Jesus said. She will deny me three times. What else could be this greater? Can you tell me anything greater than that? Can you explain to me from the Bible or in any story what is greater than denying God face to face? It was Peter. But we know the story. That from that horrific denial, Peter became one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament. When he would walk the street, even his shadows would fall on them. They would be healed. Spectacular restoration. But if God can do this to a, to a man like Peter, can he not do it for us? How big is your offense? How big is your wrong? How big is your mistake? How big is your failure? It is nothing compared to Peter. Are you there? Are you there? Then let's look. Now, what did Jesus do? Now, we are still kind of an kind of Easter message. It's like a spillover from Easter because we're talking about the Easter situation here. Now, how to overcome failure and God giving you a new slate. Number one, commit to change through repentance. Peter wept bitterly. It was repentance. He was sorry for sin. He was sorry for sin that he did. Oh, my goodness. I denied Christ three times, and he was right in telling me that so. The Bible says that, that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to grieve for your failure, for your fault. It's okay to cry because it's a sign of repentance that you are sorry for your sins. Repentance. The difference between, what, you know what's the difference between repentance and remorse? Remo re repentance means you are sorry because of sin, but remorse is sorry for being caught. Oh man, I was caught. Isn't it? I was caught. And most of those are, oh, you know, I, I'm ashamed because I was caught. But they are not sorry. Why? And what was the cause of why they, they are caught or why they are being punished or why they are being embarrassed? There's a big difference. Repentance is sorry for because of sin. Remorse is sorry for being caught. Those are the two kinds. Let me give you another exam an example. The conversation between two thieves when Jesus was hanging on the cross. One of the criminals said, Luke chapter 23, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. That was Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He wants to go out of the situation. That's remorse. I'm suffering here. Can you save yourself and save us? But you know what the other thief said? The repentant thief, he said, Hey, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. That means he owned his sin. But this man has done nothing wrong. He owned his mistake. Sorry about it. And look at the innocence of Jesus. The purity of Jesus. Then he said, Jesus, when you are in your kingdom, take me with you. And he said, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Beautiful. 
This thief did not even have time to, to know the Bible. He didn't even know how to, even did his religious duties, but because he was repentant, and Jesus saw the repentance, you're okay. You know, it's not doing our religious obligations that will bring us right before God. It is willing to change from the inside and being sorry for our sins, own it and take it, and come to Jesus. Go to the innocence of Jesus because it's the innocence of Jesus that will make you accepted in heaven, not your own innocence. He owned his failures. He owned his misdeeds. And look at the innocence of Jesus. Repentance is not being guilty forever, but valuing the lesson than the lost. You value the lesson than the, some of them people. Some people are just hurt because they lost their reputation. They lost their finances. They lost, they lost, but they are not looking at the lesson learned. That is repentance. Let me tell you this. There are two people in, 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 the, in the scene, in the crucifixion narrative, Judas and Peter. Don't you know that Jesus knew that Judas will sell him out, will betray him for 30 pieces of silver? Jesus knew. As a matter of fact, even in spite that he, Jesus knew that he's going to sell him for 30 pieces of silver, he yet spent time to wash his feet at the Last Supper. Judas. Jesus washed his feet. And also... Jesus knew that Peter will deny him three times, but both of them were still loved by Christ. Both of them, Jesus washed their feet, but both of them responded to the love of Jesus in different ways. What happened to Judas? He hanged himself. He was sorry for his sin. He was ashamed of his sin, yet he did not look at the forgiveness of God, the restoration of Jesus and the love of Jesus that he destroyed himself. But Peter wept bitterly, and he knew that Jesus was right. And he changed that night. You know, let me tell you this, that failure, every failure has a lesson. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Every learning process has a price. The first step to recover from failure is to change. Are you there? Say the word change. Do you like that word? You don't like that word? Your wife tries to change you. You don't like that. Your husband likes to change you. Not change you, but change the inside. Not change you to another man or another woman. But I'm not. And you don't like it. Don't you know that your spouses are God's tool just to sharpen you? You're, the greatest tool that God uses uh, to, uh, to, to complete a man and a woman is through marriage. You know, the Bible says that, that when God has joined together, he joins them together to complete them. That should, you're not supposed to compete with them. Amen? Oh, you buy this? I'll buy this one. No, you're competing. You're supposed to complete one another. Okay? Right? I'll buy you 10, ba- ten bags, you buy me one TV. Something like that. You know? I'm just kidding. So you're supposed to complete one another, not compete. Change is very important. The first step to recovery from failure is the word change through repentance, change from the inside. If you you do the same thing all over again, you cannot expect a different result. Are you there? If you do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So you have to change. And promising to change is not change because you are not changed till you are changed. All right? So the evidence is, and, and this morning, so how did Peter get into repentance and how was he able to change from the inside? Let us go, go back to the verse again. Luke chapter 22, verse 61 and 62. Shall we all read? The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Number one, how do people change and repent? He remembered the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. People change with the word of God. 
Because the word of God is powerful than any two-edged sword that would that cut asunder the heart and the soul. It is like a surgeon's knife that brings incision in your hearts to circumcise it to purity. That's the word of God. Also, the, the word of God is like a sword that will cut asunder. Under the surgeon's knife, it is the one that will take the infection out of your life. That's why as much as possible, the devil wants you to not to read the word of God so that you are, if you are ignorant of your Bible, then you are ignorant of Christ. But God wants to really reveal himself through his word. How many of you believe that? And you don't have the power to change people. It is God himself through his words that changes. No matter what psychology you will do to yourself or to others, it will not work the way it should. It will only bring reformation but never transformation. Because God says, Jesus said, preach the word, preach the gospel. He did not say, psychologize them, convince them, bribe them, spoil them. He said, preach the word, preach the gospel. There is power in the word of God. So that's what we need to do. Expose people to the word of God, and it will bring conviction into their lives. Are you there? So we want, don't want to, uh, to, to spread theology we want to spread Jesus. Amen. And he remembered the word of the Lord. In, his, in the pinnacle of his failure, he was restored because he remembered what God said to him, what Jesus said to him. Now listen to me very carefully. When you are in a state of failure or in a state of shock, when you are down, when you're depressed, what do you remember? What can you remember if you don't know the word? Oh, I will just listen to pastor and YouTube. Guess what? You will uh, get to the wrong channel and get the wrong message. You see, you have to know the word of God. That you have something to remember. When in your deepest dungeons, in your deepest, in your darkest nights and times, you have to remember the word of God so that from that darkness you can turn into light. The Bible says, the entrance of your word giveth light. Hello. So, the word of God. That is why it is just, if you just psychologize yourself, it's not going to work. It just worked for a few times probably, but it's never going to work. It's only the word of God. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, God. It is good that I have been afflicted that I might know your decrees. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He let me lie. He'll make me uh, lead me beside still waters. Though I walk through the valley of, of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. All of those things that you remember when you are in the deepest of the deep. Not to psychologize yourself, because if you just psychologize yourself, nothing will happen. Oh, I don't want to think of, uh, uh, I, I, will not, I don't want to think of pink elephant. I will not think of pink elephant. I will not think of pink elephant. So what are you thinking? Pink elephant. Isn't that true? Do not rehearse these things to psychologize yourself but replace it with the Word of God. Replace your negative thoughts with the Word of God because that's the only one that can increase your faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Sometimes you guys have to listen to what you're telling yourself. That's why in several messages before I said, why not tell yourself about what God says about you than what you say about yourself and you will feel better. Isn't it true? I feel better about myself when God defines who I am rather than what I did or what I was. I'm forgiven, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. 
So the first thing, the word of God. Peter, remember the words of Jesus. You will always change on a daily basis if you remember the words of God about you, about your future, about your situation, about your relationship, about your finances. Every day you can remember what Jesus or what God says, and that will transform your life, that will transform your day, and even transform the things around you. So what is the second thing that changed Peter, that, that convicted him to change? Let us look back again at the word. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. He had face to face. What does that mean? Not only the word of God transform you, but you must have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Because you, can, you must encounter the written word, but you must also experience the living word. It's Jesus God is a God of individuality. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. That's being individual, right? In God of individuality. So he, it, so he encountered Jesus face to face. I believe this is what, will, what we need nowadays to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, that we are not people observers, observers of religion. But having an encounter with Jesus Christ. I encountered God when I was 13. I turned my back on, on God for 10 years. After 10 years, I had met him again face to face. And he, he told me, Eugene, if you died in your sin, it's your choice, not mine. Then I felt that night when he showed up and I said, Lord, this is my last chance. I said, I cannot even accept myself, but I felt his manifest presence. Nope, I still love you and I still accept you no matter what you did. I could not even accept myself or like myself, but I felt his love. It's totally different, my friends, when you experience, experience Jesus in a personal way. Because Jesus is a person. We can learn the principles about him through the scriptures, but it's entirely different if you in, in, in experience him in a very personal way. You know, sometimes God allows us to be in prison so that we can have our backs in bed so that we can go to heaven. Oh, no, we can see heaven, isn't it? That's why a lot of people in prison, they, they think about God all the time. That's why Jesus said, you didn't visit me in prison. That's why sometimes there came a time that you were in the hospital, your, your back was on bed, and you're facing heaven so that you can remember God. There are things like that that happen. How many of you here have missed or dodged bullets? Was it what because you were good or just because God had a plan for you? So God is not a God of accident. So he encountered Jesus. People always have two encounters, the written word and the living word. Are you there? Now, my first encounter with Jesus Christ is that when I became, a, I was born again. The Bible says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God or perceive it. Unless a man is born of water and the spirit in the inside, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. First, you have to understand the kingdom, perceive it, then you make a decision to enter it. So, I, so the, the written word is to make you understand the kingdom and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord makes you enter the kingdom of God. John chapter 3. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Those are two things, seeing and entering. When you read the scripture, you will see the kingdom, but when you see Jesus and give your life to Christ, then you are you enter the kingdom by entering into a relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you this. It's not you getting into a certain church that makes you a Christian, but it's who gets into your life. It should be Jesus. Are you there? Say amen. amen. You guys are so silent and looking at me as if I'm told dark and never mind. And when you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, you become a child of God. And when you become a child of God, what does he do with his children? He gathers them together. When he gathers them together, that's what we call a 
family, a forever family, the local church. The next thing that, that happened in the first day of the resurrection is that although the, the dreams of the disciples were shattered, that Jesus was supposed to be their leader, and now he, was, he got crucified and died, and no, what are we going to do? Who are we going to follow? We left our vocations for three years to follow Christ. We thought that he's going to be the man to deliver us from the Romans. And their dreams were shattered, all of them. And what they did was they, look at, the, look at this verse. The second thing is commit yourself to a community. Say the word community. Ease your pain by not being alone. You have to grow in community. On the first day of Easter, the apostles were grieving together for the loss of their leader. But look, chapter 24, verse 9 to 10. The women went to the tomb, and they found the tomb was empty, and they ran back to Jerusalem. Look, when they came back from the, from the tomb, they told all these things to the... To the 11. That means they were together. They were grieving together. They were thinking together. They were in a community still. They were in pain that Jesus, whom they love, was stolen from them. Now he's no, and yet, after, on the first day of the resurrection, they were still together. That means it, Peter was in community. Say the word community. With the disciples, he didn't, oh, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'll, I'll do my own way. No, they were still together. When you fail, when you fall, when you falter, when you are depressed, the worst place to be is being alone. Some people say, I just want to be alone. Yes, of course, if you encounter Jesus, that's fine. <laughs> but sometimes you don't. Go to a community where you can be warm with each other's fire for God. And let me tell you this, that day on the first resurrection, Jesus revealed himself to the disciples in the afternoon too. So some people say, ah, oh, Jesus will reveal himself to me. Hey, Jesus reveals himself also to a community because, uh, because Jesus revealed himself to the 11 that night. So it's good to be in community. There are some people who say, oh, the Lord spoke to me. But you see, revelation without affirmation sometimes is monopoly. There's no affirmation. It's like making a hole in one every time and then nobody witnesses it. You tell people, oh, I made a hole in one, but nobody witnesses it. There's no affirmation or confirmation. But God has not only revealed himself individually, but he also reveals himself collectively in a community. It's there you grow. The word of God is a seed that grows, in your, that grows your faith. Say the word faith. So, but... A grain of soil can never grow a seed. Are you there? A grain of soil can never grow a seed. It takes a bunch of soil to grow a seed. That means you grow your faith in a community, in a local church like this. That's why, that's why in uh, April 21st, we will have a new uh, series on our small groups called... Uh, Created to Dream. It is entitled The Six Faces of Faith. So you should join a small group if you don't have a group because it's there that you can grow in a community. You learn together. It's there that you rub elbows with one another so that you'll be revealed who you are and what you are. It is there that you grow in relationships. Some of you might not like some other, other people, but you know what? This is a church we're in. We will accept you as you are, but never leave you the way you are. That's why there is a friction and conflict and disagreements in, in, in relationships. And one of them is should happen in the church because our goal here is to groom and grow Jesus Christ's image in your life. Are you there? You cannot look for a perfect church because you're not perfect. If you join a perfect church, don't join it. You will make it imperfect. We are all imperfect people here wherein God is doing his work of perfection through our afflictions, through our imperfections. Are you there? Therefore, we need everybody, the good ones and the bad ones, the good, the bad, and the 
the good, the bad, and the, and the bad. <laughs> so, we need everyone. Sometimes the Lord Jesus um, puts in our way hard stuff, hard people to soften us. Are you there? Hallelujah. In James chapter 5, 16, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Transparency. There, there's a saying by Rick Warren, revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. And you tell someone, hey, I had this problem. Help me. And people will pray for you. That's good. Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. That is why I just praise God when people come to me, Pastor, I have this problem, and, and they say, oh my goodness, this is good. It's not good for me. That's good for that person revealing his feeling. That's a start. That's a start. Amen? That's a good start. When you humble yourself and tell, hey, I messed up. Because you know what? For me, your mess will become your message. Your test will become your testimony. God will take trash and make it as a trophy. So as I was telling you my failures before, he's making a trophy out of the, when I trash my life. Are you there? So hallelujah. So thirdly, the way to overcome a failure is committing to the call of Christ in your life. Now what happened was when Peter was, was, uh, contemplating of, of what his denial, they, he, they went back to Galilee and went back fishing. And when they went, went fishing, they did not catch any fish the whole night. And in the morning, there was a man on the shore. It was Jesus. He said, hey, why don't you throw your net on the night, right side of the boat? And, and they did. And when they throw it, when they raised the net, the hull was so heavy that they could not even bring it back to the boat. And they knew it was Jesus. Wow, Jesus, because it's the second time Jesus told them, of this kind of miracle. And Peter went from the boat, swam and went there, Jesus, it's you. And then Jesus had a conversation with him. They had a breakfast. Don't you know that Jesus is, is a cook? Because Jesus prepared breakfast for them. Verse uh, 15, John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me more than this? Pointing at the fish or fishes fish and he said yes Lord he said you know that I love you and here's the response of Jesus feed my lambs a commission for the one who is condemnable who denied Christ three times how could you commission such a man and yet he said feed my lambs and he failed before, and yet God knows his future. Sometimes we are allowed to fail on purpose so we can find ourselves in Christ. And then when we are restored, the Lord commissions us. Failure is failing to fulfill our purpose in reality. Success is doing the will of God. Noah preached for 120 years and all the world did not uh, accept on, on, on God and he only had six members of his family on the ark and they were saved. But yet he was a successful man that he made it to the book of Hebrews, a man of faith. In the, in the eyes of the world, he was a failure because he preached for 120 years and only had six converts. Six converts for preaching 120 years. In the eyes of the world, he was, fa he was a failure, but in the eyes of God, he was a success. Because he did the purpose of God that time. So sometimes we measure ourselves on the size of our achievements. My friends, we measure ourselves according to what God tells us what to do. That each one of us is so unique that we have a unique purpose and we have a unique gift and function in this world. And you should find that. And you should serve him when you find it. Amen? Join a local church. And many of us have a wrong definition of success. Oh, Noah was a failure. He wasn't. There are two kinds of success. Manifestation of success and success. 
manifestation of success is, is what the world sees. Oh, you drive a nice car. Oh, you live in a big house. Oh, you have a big bank account. Oh, you look good. You're looking good. That's, what, that, that's the manifestation of success. But because when you are in God, you will see those things too. But that's not success. Success is doing your purpose. Living by divine design, but what God had told you to do in that which you do. Are you there? That's the real success. Success that never fails is the one that never fades. I will say it again. Success that never fails is the one that never fades. And that is your purpose in life. Because when you accomplish your purpose in life in this earth, it will be rewarded in heaven. It will last forever. Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That means you serve the Lord here. Not mammon, not your image, not your reputation, but you serve the Lord here. The only one who decides for your life. But one thing that I can say that Noah really was a success because it says his, all of his family were in the boat and they all got saved. They, they escaped judgment. That was good, isn't it? That his family was saved. How many of you would like your family to be saved? Give your life to Christ 100% and they will follow. And they will have a light to follow. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, when Peter preached and 2,000 people gave their lives to the Lord and, and people say to, to Peter, what must we do to be saved? And this is what Peter said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. For your family to be saved from the this coming wrath and destruction of this earth and even damnation in hell, it will only take one. Commit your life 100% and they will see the light in you and they will change. Are you there? Okay. Know your purpose. Serve the Lord. Look at this. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. That means Jesus knew that Simon will fail. And Jesus also knew that he will be restored back. And that's good. This means that a faith that's, that's, that does not fail is the one that fails. That does not fail to bounce back. That means the faith that does not fail is the one that does not fail to bounce back. He bounced back. And Jesus commissioned him. So let me tell you this. Whatever pains you may have from your failures, from your sufferings, there is a purpose for that. Once you know your purpose, it's worth it. Jesus allowed Peter's failure, but restored him back so that he could not rely on himself, that he will rely on Jesus Christ. Are you there? Sometimes our upsets are God, are God set ups. Setbacks that we can bounce back. That we can go out from these fears, uh, this, uh, fears and failures, better version of ourselves. The ladder of success is a ladder. It takes rich risk to go higher. And failures are spacious between the steps of the ladder of success. You can't get higher without them. But let me tell you this. When you miss a step, learn to find your steps back. But when you fall, listen to me very carefully, Jesus will catch you. When you fall, Jesus will catch you. So therefore, learn of him and lean on him. Lean on him. So let me just uh, close with this story by Charles Spurgeon about his life. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is, the, is called the Prince of Preacher in, in, in Europe. He has his books, devotionals, and greatly respected pastor. And he had this story that he said in one of his books. Uh, he has a younger brother who has a degenerative bone disease in the ankle. So the, his younger brother would normally fall because of it and dirty his clothes and one day his father told his younger brother hey 
if you're going to fall again and mess up your clothes and make it dirty, I'm going to spank you with a rod. And after two weeks, the father told Charles Spurgeon, he said, you know what? Your brother for two weeks has not fallen and did not mess up his clothes. Because I told him I'm going to spank him with a, with a rod. And then Charles Spurgeon said, Dad, I need to confess to you. He has been falling. But every time he falls, I pick him up and clean his clothes. This is exactly what Jesus does to all of us. We are broken. We are sinners. We have a disease inside of us that we fail and we fall. When we do fail and fall, Jesus will lift us up, pick us up, and cleanse us so that we can start all over again. Amen. Amen. That's what Jesus does to us. That's what Jesus does to your failure. That's what Jesus does to you. When you lose faith, when you lose hope, when your dreams are broken, don't give up. He will rescue you. He will pick you up. And will cleanse you so that you can live a life that's clean, bright, and glorious. And people will see, well, what's wrong with you? You have so many problems. Why is it that you are always laughing? Well, because of what Jesus has done. Can we sing that song? Hallelujah. Can we just rise from, uh, from our seats this morning? How many of you in this room, you feel like... Uh, are still guilt in your life. I'm guilty about this. If God forgives you and God cleanses you, same here. If you have failures that you're still having nightmares about, raise your right hand, Pastor. I need to be cleansed from that guilt, from those feelings of, of, of incapacities. Uh, your failures do not define you. Your mistakes do not define you. It's God that defines you. Jesus will always pick us up, cleanse us, and change us. Amen. Let's sing a song and then, uh, and then we're going to pray.
us needs rescue. Some of us needs daily rescue. And God sent His Son Jesus to pick us up and cleanse us and make us right before God on a daily basis. To be right with God is to have the peace of God and the joy of God. And in such love, we can express that love to others so that we can express the purposes of God. And Lord, this morning, everyone in this room lifted high, their hands lifted up before you, their hands and hearts open to you. Fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Let them remember your words of love and encouragement. That I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation. That I'm loved, that for God so loved the world. That we will forgive as God forgave. That we will accept as God accepted us. Lord, that we will lay hands on the sick and we will recover. That you will heal our bodies and heal us from our disease. That we will remember your words that will transform and change our out outlook today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Lord, today we thank you because you will rescue us not only from our circumstances, from our contemplation of ourselves, our situation, our circumstances. You are the, will, that will, you are the one that will rescue us. Then, Lord, we are praying this morning. We commit our lives to you. We commit our circumstances to you. We commit our problems to you. We commit our loved ones to you that you'll bring salvation and rescue to them and to us in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your loving words that as you have restored Peter and commissioned him, Lord, restore us and, and commission us today, right now, in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. to Him who is able to keep you from falling be the glory and the majesty the leader and authority for now right here to the front and we'll pray for you. God bless you. See you next week.